Well, we haven't filmed in forever. Shh. <laughs> Don't tell them that. Hello, everybody. Hi, I'm Jim. And I'm Ryan. And this is the Concept Crucible Podcast. All right. So we got a we got a heavy topic to talk about this time. Yeah. We're, we're gonna talk about class war. Well, we just we just came out of an election. Yeah. And uh, I as I talked about last week, and I am super politically naive, as Ryan pointed out, mm. when I miscategorized our liberal party. <laughs> no, you miscategorized the NDP party. I thought. No, that's right. You NDP. Right of center. That's what confuses you about the Liberal Party. Yep. Yeah. So, but regardless, so, I, I yeah. yeah, I'm, I'm not super up on my my political theory or or positioning or thing like that. And that's part. I think we talked about it tonight. We we were originally going to do an episode on the election. No. Um. But we spent so much time talking about the election and and the issues relating to it that realized what we were really talking about ninety percent of the time was was class and issues of class. Mm-hmm. Because I am strongly, I feel disenfranchised, especially during this election. I talked about it on uh, last Tuesday, Mm -hmm. and you know, because I I am I am a member of the lower class. I mean, I don't feel like it anymore sometimes, but that's how I grew up was was sort of food bank and and stuff like that. And we we would always vote for the NDP. Because I mean, you made a reference. You're like, you're like, you know, the liberals have a better plan. Mm-hmm. Um, neither of us vote conservative. It's just not a thing that we do because we both work in the public sector, <laughs> <laughs> and they don't like us very much. No. But we, you know, you know, they, you're, you're like the liberals have a better plan. But the thing is, is for 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 them, often, especially at the provincial or, or federal level, uh, poor people aren't part of that plan, and the NDP at least knows that we exist mm-hmm. which is kind of nice but so i when the ndp the ndp made a big run right this election and they forgot about poor people and i'm like now nobody remembers poor people why am i even doing this i still voted i don't know that i feel super good about it but i voted and my candidate won so i guess that means something mm-hmm. but yeah, I figured that it would. We figured that it would be better to talk about class and class privilege rather than just sit here and, and rehash an election that the news media has hashed quite well, and probably in a far in a manner far more skilled than either of us could muster. No. Well, not to mention by the time this airs, it might more time will have elapsed. Well, yeah. So it might not. Even yeah, the election be was like two weeks ago. Yeah, from filming, so so it might be more relevant to talk about class and our our perceptions of it because really, as Jim was saying, it did can't come out that. Like when I when I vote or when I was forming my vote, uh, I tended to think about it in terms of um, how viable the economic plans were, and only then did my value start to f- uh, factor into it afterwards. But for the most part, I didn't really think about it. It's just like whose plan made sense in terms of tax breaks, tax cuts, extending taxes and whatnot. How are you going to pay for your services? How are you going to pay for your jobs? How are you going to stimulate the economy? Bringing business in, uh, social aware, welfare programs, I'm big on those. I think that we need to, to definitely keep those in the game. Um, but then Jim started talking about the idea of somebody who identify or somebody whose values that you're voting for represents you as a person in some regard I, I don't even know that i would go that far as as far as values i don't i don't think i would make an argument that says that um people in parliament don't share the same values as me i think i we have lots of values in common mm-hmm. um they are not monsters no most of the time most no. of them some of them but no the, for in, in in seriousness there it is less to do with values and more to do with sort of of people whose policies will actually affect you well maybe maybe it's the policies i always think when i think of disenfranchisement and this is why i feel so weird talking about class disenfranchisement as we sit here in the condo that i live in i mean roommates but you know i like like recording on the camera that i own you know next to the editing computers and whatnot like it's i'm not really poor anymore but that I still am in here, mm-hmm. and it is it is definitely a thing that I that I still carry around with me, but which makes it extra weird. But I always think of it, and I talked about it on Tuesday in terms of, um, you know, like First Nations peoples. I mean, there isn't a party in our in our country that looks out for First Nations people. It's just not. It's just not a thing. Well, 
Like like there isn't a, there isn't there isn't a party that is that is a, a major player at any level. Yeah, I was gonna say there's probably there are parties. That's true. There are probably provincial parties that are in certain in, in, cer- in certain writings, but yeah. but but there isn't there isn't a, a party that's active in KW. and and has and has <laughs> and has power at any yeah. kind of provin- I mean, our Green Party only has one seat. Federally. Federally. Yeah. <laughs> um. So I mean, in, in that sense, that, that that it has nothing to do with with people's individual values and more to do with the fact that I you know like like you know I speaking as as a member of 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 poor people mm-hmm. have problems that these human beings cannot even imagine having and I think that's the same with 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 marginal like groups who are marginalized by race groups who are marginalized by gender uh, by sexual orientation like the fact of the matter is I mean I mean the reason why uh, we did a video on this too when we talked about about dressing up like uh, First Nations people uh, for Halloween. Is is that the reason why white people don't think it's a problem? Is because they don't understand why it would be a problem. Like it's just not part of their universe. In the same way that the notion of not being able to send your kids on a school field trip or have your kids enjoy pizza day because it's too much money, and the social cost that that comes at for your kids is a thing that is outside of most politicians universe it's just not a thing that they can even imagine happening Mm -hmm. and we get so we feel so happy that they even notice that we just sort of hope they'll do something about it Mm -hmm. and then when they don't we get all surprised or we act like we weren't surprised because it's like Asking that girl out that you re, you know you're really really nervous about it, and then you're like, hey, do you wanna, do you wanna maybe, like go to the go to the dance with me? And she's like, not really. And you're like, yeah, that's cool. I didn't want I didn't really want to go with you anyway. I mean, I knew that this was, in the, but I had to try, right? I mean, that was, I I I, I got the courage to try this at least, because you're a man, and that's what you're supposed to do. Well, I'm I'm sure it works the other way around for women too. It's just more of a sour grapes thing. But I mean. The fact of the matter is that every four years we sort of uh, four people are like, "Hey, you guys want to dance with us?" And they're always like, "No." Okay. Well, I mean, we had to try, right? Yeah. I'm not sure how I feel about that. Actually, I am sure how I feel about that, and the answer is pretty crap. Yeah. But. But anyways, yeah, we we realized though that the the stuff that we started talking about when we were planning the episode, the the class issue was much more interesting to talk about actually uh i'll admit this on camera but you telling your story reduced me to silence and i'm like maybe i'm not going to talk about the election because you know i came in here expecting to talk about you know how i thought that this party's idea was really good and why this party was stupid and how when it came to the the leaders i thought like you know this leader was was the best of all of them because like their attack campaign was crappy and their accusations were crappy and how in the end, right before the election, I had this grand realization that ultimately none of the parties are evil. They just have varying different strategies on how to bring about human flourishing. Mm-hmm. And then you just pick the one that you think is going to have the most success or closely aligns with your values. But then you told your story and then you started to talk about class or we started to discuss class. And I'm just like, no, I think you're I think you're right, though. I think I think that that is exactly sort of what people do. Mm-hmm. I mean, no, no matter your class or, 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 or gender, you, you sort of, you pick the group of people that you think is going to, I mean, that's how democracy works. You pick the group right. of people that you think is going to work out best for you mm-hmm. and, 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 or for everyone. Mm-hmm. And you sort of run with it and hope that it works out and you do your be- the best you can. Mm-hmm. And I mean, sometimes that works out in some ways and sometimes it doesn't. Often it doesn't, because, but that's mostly because... I can't really blame individual politicians because politics is complicated. Mm-hmm. Like you end up compromising a lot of things in order to get a couple of things. I always think of um, President Obama, a man who I'm intermittently a fan of. I'm not a super fan of drone strikes, but he is really funny and he did slow jam the news. <laughs> so my affection for people who slow jam the news is strong. But he uh, he did a Q&A about a year ago um, and one of the people in there was John Green, and he, he, he's a big anti... In addition to being a, a, an author um, and vlogger, he is also an anti-penny advocate. He hates the penny in America. He's like, we need to get rid of pennies. And he says, 
President Obama, why will you not get rid of the penny? And Obama's like, listen, getting rid of the penny would save us a whole bunch of money. No problem. Thing is, Congress has to make me get rid of the penny. I want to do it, but Congress has to give me the power to do it. And they haven't yet. we got a lot of other stuff on the table, like this Affordable Care Act. And so, you know, it just sort of gets lost in the shuffle. $21 million a year that gets lost in the shuffle. And, you know, it's, it's one of those things where you have to, there's a lot of give and take. And I think that that gets, there's a lot of times when we miss out on that. But part of it, I think, is, is that, especially from, like, from feeling disenfranchised. And I can only think that if, if I, a 31-year-old white male mm-hmm. who has a, a, you know, a graduate degree and a reasonably well-paying job, feel disenfranchised, how actually disenfranchised people must feel about these elections. Yeah. <laughs> I am not actually disenfranchised. I just feel that way. Mm-hmm. But... I mean, and they're, they're doing the same thing. It is just that they have been burned so many times uh, that it is hard to. I mean, every time that girl turns you down from the big dance, it gets a little harder to ask the next one. Well, uh, to, to make a less dating-specific um, example, it was the same with doing fundraising. Yeah. You know, you you just need one yes to make you feel good and preferably you need that one yes early in the day so that it sustains you the rest of the day Mm -hmm. but when you get turned down after turned down after turned down on your asks it's really demoralizing it's really hard to bring yourself up to making another ask yeah well at least in fun fun development so Mm -hmm. um but yeah it's (laughs) it's really hard to to build any kind of optimism and and forward momentum when things don't go your way or you can't you just manage to never cut a break yeah and i mean there are lots of groups of people in here like I, the, the one i am most familiar with is class because mm-hmm. that's sort of where i that's sort of where i come from mm-hmm. but um and i would love to get the opportunity to to talk about some of the other the, the others in the in a later cast but yeah we're definitely going to need people who can speak up <laughs> yeah, people, those issues. people who aren't two white guys in their yeah. late 20s early 30s yeah of of middle lower middle class but there's definitely only so much that we're able to talk intelligibly about before we are clearly out of our elements so we're not going to speculate an armchair our way through anything like that yeah i mean i don't i, I love some good armchair class discussion <laughs> i'll save that for another time yes Yes, and we'll put that up as a private video. No, no, no. <laughs> um, but it's 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 one of those things I always think about. I mean, I guess the the question is sort of what do we mean when we talk about class? No, like I mean, it's it's easy to to pick out when you're in it, but you know, in terms of lower class or upper class or poor or working poor or mm-hmm. middle you know middle class upper middle class and what that means. And I mean, there's there's a lot of um stricter definitions about this you know you can you can sort of compartmentalize people by their their incomes and their and their possessions and things like that um but it's harder to compartmentalize the privilege that goes with that i think mm-hmm. and, and and that that is the the sort of core element i think of class warfare is the fact that I have, and, 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 and it works both ways. Middle class people have problems that I literally have no idea exist. Mm-hmm. Um, like, I, I can actually, I have a perfect example of this. So, uh, my mom stays with me, and recently, uh, in the last like six months, we all split, everybody in the house, we split on a housekeeper. Mm-hmm. Once a month, we have a human being come into this this apartment and wash the floors and and like clean the bathroom and and I don't even know because I'm not here but but like vacuum they vacuum and, and things like that things that most of us don't have time to do or or don't care about in the way that we should mm-hmm. but and, you know, and so we're just like it is cheaper to us to to split the cost and have a human being do this who is not us than it is to actually do it mm-hmm. and that's so weird to me and one day 
I was here. Uh, we were leaving to visit visit family, and, and they were here. And I was looking at this coffee cup that Kaylee had left on, on my table from a, uh, a jam session like three days before. I'm staring at it. And I now I understood in that moment why people clean before their housekeepers show up. It seems so weird when you think about it. You're like, why would you clean? You have this human <laughs> being who's coming to clean your house. Why would you bother? And the answer is because you know that this is a thing you should have done yourself. And when another person is there doing it and you recognize them as a person who is clearly cleaning up your mess, mm. or in this case, someone else's mess that you let become your mess, you feel like a jerk. Because you're like, all I had to do to keep her from having to do that was keep my space in the way that I that I would recognizably like it to be kept. Mm -hmm. It is it is weird and it isn't a thing that I ever thought about until I was actually in that moment. I just had absolutely no idea that that was a problem that happened. Mm -hmm. And in the same way that middle class people don't know what it's like to go to the food bank or to you know stand in line for social services or things like that like it's just not a thing they have to do mm -hmm. so I don't know I don't know this is one of those things where I'm sort of skirting around the more personal examples because it is a thing that, that really bugs me but cause it, because it is a thing that I am constantly aware of in a way that makes me not feel not very good you know, I don't I don't know how much I can add to it because as I said when we were preparing the show is some of the some of the things that we were talking or joking about it I identified with it but uh, I was fortunate that um, my family hid it from me and I was blissfully unaware of it until I got older and looked back on it and realized it but I mean like your joke about the cheese thing for example oh, yeah, yeah, yeah we should probably tell the cheese thing because i mean it's it's a, it's, <laughs> it's another, at least funny it's another perfect example and because you and i i didn't realize it until you told the story but you and i both had the exact same experience yes in terms of of cheese of cheese all things, so. cheese indicates your class no um i i always tell people whenever i'm at like a like a uh a, a fancy networking event or something where they have one of those cheese plates you use the example of prosciutto yeah. We had never had prosciutto yeah, never had before prosciutto. we started going to these things. Yeah. Like, things where there are caterers. No, it was always, like, uh, ham, uh, summer s or salami, sla sausage, anything that's, you know, uh, anywhere between a buck sixty nine for 100 kilograms, or 100 kilograms, 100 grams, or maybe you might spring for, like, the $3 stuff. Or they come in those, like, $5 double packs at the grocery store? Yeah, pre-packaged. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So either if you get fresh and it's cut, it's always, you know, the, the Mediterranean chicken for, like I said, a buck sixty nine. Uh, otherwise, pre-packaged, you know, bologna. Bologna yep. was another one, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. But, uh, but I, I always, whenever people would, would talk about their, their amazing cheese, cheese possessions, which... That to me was 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 the real indicator. It was not merely having this cheese at events and enjoying it, which is a thing I learned to do because brie is really good. Mm -hmm. It was buying this cheese and having it in your house, not for special occasions, but just because cheese. Yeah. And and like we only have one kind of cheese in my house, and this is still true. Actually, that's not that's not entirely true. I have some parma, like some real parmesan in the fridge. No, there's only two kinds of cheese. There's the brick cheese, like the the marble cheese, and then there's Kraft single slices. You, know, you <laughs> sir are mistaken because there is only one kind of cheese, cheese that is on sale. <laughs> shit ain't on sale. Shit ain't coming home. Or coupons. Coupons are a good one too. Coupons counts as on sale. Yeah. Like coupons, coupons get you a reduced price. But like, like if that if that stuff isn't you know like it's seven dollars, eight dollars normally. If that stuff isn't two and a half dollars, mm -hmm. guess what? We ain't eating cheese this week. No, you better hope you have enough milk to get your uh, your. Bun. I got a freezer full of cheese, my friend. A freezer full of cheese, just in case there's a cheese famine and the price doesn't drop for a bit. Or it skyrockets. Not only am I in a position to become a great cheese tycoon, but I will have cheese for days. You better be careful because, um, was it last year? There's a bunch of 
cops in the Niagara region who are busted for smuggling cheese across the border. I'm not smuggling my cheese yeah, anywhere, well, man. you know what? They don't know that because it's frozen in your freezer. <laughs> if you mafia. Who, who <laughs> smuggles brick marble cheese? Who does that? The cops apparently do in the oh Niagara region. Anyways, we, we got off the point. The point is... <laughs> we have to include a link to that now, by the way. Uh, we're going to have to find it the, and throw it we'll in the it. show We'll do it. We'll do it. It'll be in the show notes. But, um, yeah, you brought up this idea that you go to this event and there's either cheese you've never seen before or meats you've never seen before, and you just like walk up and you have no idea what it is, and or straight up food you don't understand how to eat. Yeah, caviar. I've never. I still haven't had it, but I don't know. I, I think that's a spready thing. Like you spread it on stuff. Maybe. I mean, you, know, you don't I've just had, like you don't just like spoon it. I've had roe on sushi, and I go to the all you can eat sushi yeah. places. But I mean, I've had fish eggs, but. Um, yeah. but no, I always, my, my example that I think of is always fondue, which, which admittedly is not a middle-class thing that middle-class people eat every night, but it is a thing which, with which, as I understand it, they have some experience. Hmm. And, uh, and I remember my first like fondue occasion where I'm like, what do I do with this fork? And, and I actually, a friend of mine with the first time we did it, um, and they, they were they were like lower middle class when they did it. And it was like a special Christmas thing. And it was so bad that her dad stabbed himself with a fondue fork. <laughs> she doesn't watch the podcast, thankfully. But she would remember the occasion. Probably because her dad killed himself on pretty much every fancy food they ever tried to have for Christmas. But, yeah. Straight up stabbed himself with a fondue fork. Because it's just like, how does this... I don't even... Like, I just put it on like this, right? Yeah. Oh, I just fondue my hand now. But yeah, like there's 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 all these things you don't recognize. It's um, I find it a lot in my palate, in in combinations of food or whatnot that I recognize that they're good. Like I understand how people could like them, mm-hmm. you know. And this is in restaurants and, and, and things like that. Uh, I have to do a bunch of fine dining stuff for work you know, once or twice a year, and I understand how it is good. But. It isn't a taste that makes sense to me because it's something I've never experienced before. Mm-hmm. Uh, because it, I mean, fine dining for us was like pizza, and pizza mm-hmm. was pizza was a privilege. Yeah. Pizza was what the Ninja Turtles ate. <laughs> pizza is still what the Ninja Turtles eat. Don't let Michael Bay tell you anything different. Yeah, well, I'll reserve judgment on that one until the movie comes out. I'm just saying they better eat pizza. Yeah. Well, we eat pizza to prepare for the show. So it's true. That's our. That's our. Or, because we're Ninja Turtles. We are Ninja Turtles. Bearded. What? He's Donatello. I am Raphael. <laughs> Today I am. You're not an asshole. <laughs> uh, but yeah, well, and to to bring the, the the conversation back, like when you said, that's how you saw when you first walked into it. Like, like that's how you know middle class people roll. When you and I were growing up, our parties were ultimately plastic bowls with chips in it. And like, for for my family New Year's Eve kind of deal, our family deal New Year's Eve was to go out and rent six to eight movies and try to. Me and my sister, being young, try to stay up as late as we can watching these movies. Mm-hmm. You know, so my sister and I would pick two or three movies, and then because it was all you know the, the cheaper stuff from the, the local variety shop, or whatever. Uh, and then my parents would grab a couple, and yeah, that's that's how we rolled. That's that was our party, you know. And I don't, so I don't think that's entirely weird. No, it's. I it's mean, I weird. mean, I mean, no, but even in the sense of light, like middle, I, I think it. I'm just thinking about it now, and I think it has less to do with sort of specific things, mm. and more to do with the notion of, and and this I think is what it, what what class comes down to is regarding yourself as a have or a have not, mm. and what it means to be a have. Or a have not. I mean, because certainly, in comparison to, you know, the upper class, like like the the. Um, there's this line from Bullworth, uh, which is probably weirdly one of my favorite movies, uh, because it has rapping Warren Beatty. <laughs> but he he at one point mentions he's talking about race relations and he, and he and he says black people have more in common with white people than they do with rich people. And, I mean, not to minimalize the effects of contemporary racism, because they certainly exist, it is, it is also true that class cert tends, tends to run a bit deeper. Um, and it's because you, 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 what you're aware of 
isn't so much the difference in specific stuff, but the distance in that stuff. I mean, and the notion that renting a big pile of movies and and doing something like that. I mean, lots of lots of people of every class do that, mm. but it's it's that's like that's a special occasion. Like that's a mm. big deal. Mm. That isn't something you would do, you know, like once every couple of weeks or something no. like that. Like it better be somebody's birthday. No. You know, the yep. notion of of baking your own cakes instead of having them baked for you yeah. or well, the only other time, um, so I mean, I did have a Nintendo growing up, a mm -hmm. Nintendo enter Entertainment System. But the big deal was um, my dad made an agreement with me that if I could get ten spelling tests perfect in a row, he would write me an N sixty four. I only ever did it once. <laughs> Usually, I would get to like eight or nine, and I'd make a mistake, and I'd you know get nine out of ten on it, and have to start the whole thing. It had to be in a row. This is so, why, and spelling. You were a Hufflepuff and not a Ravenclaw. <laughs> but yeah, it was, it was one of those things that's just little things like that. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was a special occasion. I remember I stayed up all night playing Shadows of the Empire. I, I, milked, I milked that experience. Every minute of it. Every yeah. day. I was so tired the next day, but I was up all night playing Shadows of the Empire when I got that 64. And I was so proud of it. And my dad, you know, I imagine he, he was proud of the fact that I was, I was able to get 10 in a row, but... Uh, it's, it's just a highlight in my mind of, of something that I was able to do as a, yeah. as a, as a kid. Yeah, it's the, it's the notion that, like, like I think it's the, the distance that we notice. In the same way that, um, you know, it's impossible to not notice the distance between, the, in, in, say, income between First Nations reserves. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and not just not just in income, but in terms of, so, of social support and mm -hmm. things like that. Like, there's there's huge gulfs there. And it's it's, it's not the stuff that bugs you it's the gap and the fact that often people on the other side of that gap are unaware of that gap i mean that's that's i think the nature of privilege mm -hmm. um, if i were to opine on the nature of privilege i think that that would be it is is that is that you you sort of you get to walk around oblivious of the gaps between you and other people um, and everybody does that to one extent or another, but but class is where it hits me because I grew up working poor. Oh, and the to bring it back to the election example, this is the perfect yeah. case where I was completely unaware of what was going on when I and I was t waxing virtues about the parties, and then you're like, okay, that's fine. The NDP are gonna you know do do such and such to cut taxes for the poor or to cut taxes for for basically the middle class. Yeah. But the people who need the help the most don't make enough money to have to pay taxes. Yep. They're not going to get benefits from, from this this policy okay. change. And in, 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 you said that, and it just, my brain kind of stopped. And that's that was the beginning. I don't know if you noticed it, but I shut up during that part of our preparing session. Just I'm sitting there like, yeah, no, I'm, I suddenly acutely became aware that I am middle class white. I don't have any problems. Like, right. I mean, I have problems, but I don't have problems compared to like people who, when you're looking at the parties and in terms of like social welfare or whatever, the people who really do need the programs. For the record, I paid taxes for the first time this year. I actually, I, I, I made enough. I, I made enough. I will confess that I will made enough. I made yeah. enough money to pay taxes. Well, and this is only the second. And I feel year. great. I think this is only the second year that I've had to pay taxes because beyond that, I was in, I was a student. Yeah. So it was it was a different. But it's but it's one of those things where yeah, yeah like people who promise tax cuts and whatnot, mm -hmm. um, and tax credits and, and things like that, and the the poorest sort of 10, 15, 20 percent of your population, yeah. they don't pay taxes anyway. They don't they don't pay income taxes because they do not they literally do not have enough yeah. income. I don't know. It depends on where what, what country you live in. Um, mm -hmm. In Canada, I remember for a long time when I was like 19, 20, 21, and they would like every year the government would would send me a form and they'd be like, hey Jim. How much money did you make this year? And I'd write down a number that was how much money I had made that year. And they would write me an apology and send me a check and say, Oh, man, <laughs> buddy, we're really sorry. <laughs> Look, uh, let's give you some money and to, like, try not to spend it on drugs or something, okay, man? Yeah. Like, just, just what, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm saving up for school. They're like, cool. And eventually they gave me a big pile of loans and I went to school. 
And that was where I learned all kinds of things. But it is, it is, yeah, it's, it's that gap. You know, and it and it's 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 always the stuff that you don't see. And in the same way that it is difficult for guys to imagine I think the the I was gonna actually use the example of street harassment mm-hmm. for women, but I think a better example is just feeling safe walking alone at night. Mm-hmm. I have never perhaps in my most paranoid moment you know on a, on a path with no lights uh, but apart from that I have never ever felt in danger at night even when there are ostensibly dangerous people around mm. I have never felt da- in, in danger I'm a 300 pound 6 foot tall white guy I have twice not like two specific instances but there's two conditions usually it's one when it's like late at night and I don't know where I am, so it's just like a paranoia that I don't mm-hmm. know where I am. But the only time that I do feel like I have a target on my back, which is the closest I will ever come to feeling this way, is when I get off my shift at work as a security guard and I still have my security uniform on. Mm. And if I run into people who have like either we ejected or just don't like security guards or whatever, because I, I, it's got the bar logo across the front. Sometimes I still have my tag on and then it says in big red letters on the back of my sweater, security. And it's the same with my shirt. It's the only time where when I walk to my car or when I'm walking from my car to my house, I'm, I keep my hands usually in my pocket and I, I grip on my flashlight. Um, that way, if somebody happens to drunkenly, you know, like recognize me or something, or cost me or whatever, then I can, you know, blind them or whatever. But I would say that's the probably the closest. And like, like I'm also three hundred plus pounds, six foot four. Yeah, like it, it's, it's bigger it's, than me. It's not. We shoot him shorter. It's not like it's not like I'm in any danger of being harmed. But that's the only time, and I I realized that, and that was kind of one of the moments I'm like. Man, if I feel this way, imagine yeah. somebody else in somebody else's shoes. So I would just to, not to hijack the conversation, but um, that's the only other time that yeah. I felt. No, and it's 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 one of those things. Like again, it's yeah. it's, it's gaps that until we are made aware of them, mm. we're we're not aware of them. Mm. And and it's I think it's the same thing with class. Um, I think it's the same thing with with race. I mean, Facebook is full of statuses about how we're all human. We did a video on that too, and why that's a problem. Mm. Um, because when you, when you say I don't see our differences, what you also say is I don't see your struggles, mm-hmm. and we all have struggles to varying degrees. It is far better to appreciate them than not. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, election. <laughs> now I, I I don't know that I have a strong conclusion for this. I mean, apart from it 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 is worthwhile I think to think about what class you come from and how it. And how it affects your values. I mean, that's a thing I spend a lot of time thinking about. I don't, I don't often like the feelings I have. I don't like feeling out of place. I don't like um, feeling like I don't belong. And I know that one day, presumably, I'm going to have kids, and I don't want them to have these feelings. Mm. I, I want them to be aware of these gaps, but I also like there. Are, there's a as much as I have my my working poor pride. I also, you know, and I, and I would love to have kids that grow up with that. I also don't want to have kids who grow up facing the same kind of adversity. I think that's what everybody wants. Mm-hmm. And that's what my father always stressed, is that he always wanted to provide for me a better life than he yeah. had. And My mom's the same way. Yeah, and that's something that I internalize, that I hope that I provide a slightly better childhood than what I had. Mm-hmm. I mean, not that I had a bad childhood, but you know what I mean. The, always making things better as Wait, you keep going let me, forward. Let me, let me quote, um, I believe it was our last podcast. On the Greek proverb? The goal is to plant trees under which we will not sit. Yeah, whose shade we will not enjoy. Yes. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a fine and noble yeah, pursuit. Yeah. I'm intrigued, uh, and I would love to hear your thoughts on class in the comments. And, and whether you're aware of a gap or whether you're not or whether you think the gap is real. Because um, it might, like, like, I think a lot of it, th- then this is why I have such a hard time talking about it, is, I mean, partly because a lot of it is, is stuff that's deeply internal to me, but partly because 
it it ent- it is so entangled with the way that I see the world that it is difficult to tell what what is the resultant of class and what is just part of who I am. I mean, that's the thing is 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 you just it's you 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 grow up. It's it's systemic. You grow up inside this structure, and then it becomes a, a task to escape it. Well, I'll tell a fish to think about the water. It's just all around you. You don't really notice yeah. it. So yeah, leave a comment with how you notice class, um, whether whether up or down, because I'm really intrigued to find out. You know, this has been a pretty heavy thing. We have a little bit of time left, and we skipped our our icebreaker. We did skip our icebreaker. Why don't Why don't we yes. end on a happy note? Because yes. I just recently went to a wedding this weekend, and Jim, you did a wedding about a month ago, right? I was a best man. Yes. Yeah. So our icebreaker was gonna be. What's our favorite memory from a wedding we've ever been to? Because weddings are great. They celebrate union. They bring people together. You Doesn't share. Doesn't matter what class you come from. They <laughs> all do it. Yeah. And and every every kind of... Like, I went, this wedding was uh, infused with... Um, well, it was, the theme was all about movies. And it was also heavily Portuguese. Um, but, I mean, like, you can go to different cultural weddings yep. and whatnot. So, um, I guess I'll start. Yeah. My favorite uh, experience or memory from a wedding was actually from my stepmother and father's wedding. It was, it was both their third marriage, so they decided to have something fun with it um, rather than doing the traditional route. So they ended up doing a Roaring Twenties gin joint wedding where uh, there was a madam. She was kind of the MC of the evening. In the upper level was my stepmother and her maid of honor. And my dad was a mob boss named Muscles Malone. I was I was little John, one of the bouncers, <laughs> and I was only like what thirteen, fifteen. So I, I assume two, you're only six foot two. It was I was it was two thousand three. It was two thousand three. So. Um, so yeah, I, and I had like a fake mustache on cause I was still in cadets and I couldn't grow facial hair. Right. So, Oh, I should probably, should, wrong gesture, but, uh, don't rub <laughs> your beard on the podcast. Right? No. Can you hear it? <laughs> but anyway, so I had a, I had a fake mustache on, we had Tommy guns and, uh, you know, when the wedding started, it was set up like a dinner theater. So, uh, my dad's best man went over and called up to the, called up to, uh, Lola, Lola Lovely, I think was my, my stepmom's code name. And it was like, hey, Muscles is fixing to get hitched. Do you want to get married kind of deal? And so, you know, the madam goes in, comes back. Okay, but you need a minister. All right, boys, go get a minister. So my my stepbrother and I go out, and the priest was outside. So we bring, we drag him in, like, under one under arm under each of them. And he comes in like this, and, you know, acting all scared. He was he was totally into it. And he's like, okay, fine, I will do it. But everybody must surrender their guns. So we had baskets and everybody pulled out their plastic fake guns, put it in there. And then they had the service. And then after the service, I don't remember a dinner. I think it was just snack foods. But um, then we ended up having um, like a mini casino, like a Monte Carlo nice. casino. Uh, I was the blackjack dealer. We had uh, roulette and a few other things, all for tokens, for cash prizes and whatnot. Uh, it was just a great time. That all, you look at all the pictures, and we're all in zoot suits, and everybody dressed up in flapper outfits and whatnot. So it was a good time. It was a it was a good, fun, different kind of wedding. So that's that's probably my favorite. Wow. My favorite one. So so Ryan earlier to, prior to this when we went over the icebreaker mentioned the gangster theme wedding, but I didn't get nearly this much detail or realize <laughs> nearly how cool it was. Yeah, I'll, I'll show you pictures sometimes. It was it was I quite the, to see them. quite the experience. No, my my favorite wedding moment. Uh, I have been in three weddings now, and I have been to about seven, and I like the day before. I like partly because I like things in potentialities, but also just because. There's a lot of things going on the day before that are that are nitty gritty. So like in Ryan and Andrew's wedding that I was just in, um, Ryan Ryan Walsh, who is on the, who is on the channel, um, we'll link to a video with him in it over Ryan's face because that's where I usually put them. But um, you know we we went we we had dinner with his family and we partied with them for a while and then we went back to our hotel room and played magic until like two in the morning and then a couple of people tried to kill each other in the hallway. <laughs> But, or uh, I was a bridesmaid in my friend Amanda's wedding. And the day, we, we did, she's from North Carolina and we did all, like she did all her own catering with with her family and the groom's family and the all, all the bridesmaids and groomsmen came and helped out. And so the day before her wedding, 
we were all like 12 or 15 of us piled in the groom's parents' house and we were just you know, grating cabbage for coleslaw and smoking ribs and chicken and making all kinds of things. And it was really fun. I mean, it's all the work that goes into the wedding. And then when you see that, and then you, you see all of these people invest in something that is going to last ostensibly forever, that you, I mean, I mean, and they, they, they put themselves into it in a way that I find absolutely in incredible and in a way that I am consistently honored to be a part of. And so the day before, when all of that work is really hard, because I mean, as a best man, day of, all you gotta do, make sure that he isn't late, don't lose the rings. Mm -hmm. two, two, two things, make sure he isn't late, don't lose the rings. One out of two is not bad, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we will see you guys in two weeks. So I'm Jim. And I'm Ryan. We're signing off. Stay awesome. The secret rule of this podcast is everything you like, I cut. Oh, well, one, one day we'll open up the curtain and show people what it's like to film. We'll, yeah. set, we'll set up a camera. They know what it's like to film. We're doing it right now. We'll, 